Good morning and welcome to Monday's Live. I am Elle Cole, the mom and blogger behind cleverlychanging.com. Cleverlychanging.com is a site about finance, health and wellness, and also homeschooling and parenting. Each week we have Monday's Live where we bring to you a conversation about current events or about something that is relevant to our time. And today is no different. So we invite you to share this conversation with someone else and also tune in again next week. All right, tell us who you are, please. I am trying to figure that out today. <laughs> I am Janice Adams, and whether I come to you today with my author hat, my historian hat, my downright annoyed with the headlines today hat, I'm Janice Adams. My website is JaniceAdams.com. Um, Elle and I share our being mothers of twin daughters. I am also the grandmother of two granddaughters and, and uh, two grandsons. And, um, you know, I, I am so anxious to get into today's conversation because I just don't think there is a minute to lose or a minute to waste on the things that are happening right now. So, you know, we want to start at the top with it. Look, I've been a journalist for decades and basically nothing surprises me, but sometimes the ferocity and the rapid fire nonsense is, you know, I'm getting accustomed to things that I shouldn't and none of us should be getting accustomed to. I think one of the things that I really wanted to talk about this morning was Trump's, we have to say journalistically, alleged comments but they're only alleged for people who haven't been listening to him for the last four years. You know, um, his disparaging remarks about the military and about people who are veterans who are disabled and veterans who have died, uh, who are losers and suckers and that kind of um, comment. First of all, that that's the kind of comment that's in his wheelhouse. So I believe it on that level. I personally was not a fan of, of John McCain, but I am a fan of decency. And when John McCain was ill and after he died, Trump was still doing the loser and sucker disparagement of John McCain. I, I watched one time when someone put in his hand a, a Congressional Medal of Honor um, awarded to the military. And the way he looked at it was like, uh, you know, he just kind of thumbed it in his hand like, you know, and he said, I always wanted one of these. And it was as though it was some kind of jewelry bauble. In, and I wish he had wanted to have to do what it took to get one of those in order to have one of those. And um, I am of the generation where I remember being a kid when Muhammad Ali had to say no, he was not going into the military. And he spoke about not going to fight in Vietnam because he said, Essentially, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but the line that is most memorable is that he said that no one in Vietnam ever called him nigger. No one ever harassed his parents. No one ever called them boy, boy from Vietnam. And why should he go to shoot little brown people in the mud? For what? He said, just take me to jail. And but many black men and women did end up in Vietnam, the Vietnam for which Trump conveniently had bone spurs. Um, many today, we talk about people disproportionately dying on the front lines in terms of the pandemic and COVID-19. And we have to remember that because 
for the same reason that we are disproportionately on the front lines of healthcare and social services and transportation and all of that, we are also disproportionately still on the front lines of the military. So when he disparages people in the military, he is disparaging disproportionately black and brown people who are in the military right now in the so-called volunteer army, um, who some obviously volunteer for patriotic reasons, some volunteer for pragmatic reasons, because outside of the military, blacks are still disproportionately not getting a fair shake as we apply for jobs. So I just wanted to get that one out to begin today. I must say that when I heard the words, I was hurt, not because I was surprised. They were really in line with the person he has shown us that he is. But I was hurt because as a daughter of someone who fought in the military, as a sister, to someone who has fought in the military, I know the sacrifice that they give. And it's not just, their service isn't just for the country. So when they go and they fight in war, their whole family is sacrificing. And so I just felt like there was a disconnect with what he said and their service. It was a lack of appreciation. And so there have been times when people who died in the military, their families were called and he spoke with them. And on occasions, the families were disappointed. So because we do have that narrative, it wasn't completely mind boggling that this would happen. I also feel that for the journalists and the reporters to share this story, they were again under attack because there are a group of people who do not believe that the president would say this. And so um, I can't remember the exact name of the paper that first published it, if it's a paper, but it is an outlet. It's the Washington, oh, this particular story is the Washington Post led on it. So, so it was in the Washington Post, but there is a group of, um, there's a group of reporters that are from, uh, not the watch, they're from a different um, sector that actually, they have people in every part of the military who actually oh. were the ones who reported it. And I will find that before this conversation is over um, because I think it's important now that that particular segment, they're under attack and they're being told, you know, so people are like, this never happened. and the press has really been under attack during this administration. And so what we see from the report actually being done is that the attack has heightened. And so I think there are so many things that we should be concerned about, but you know, I think so many people have been in denial about what the president says. And they often say that oh, he didn't say that or dismiss it or say, oh, he was joking. Because we often hear when he does say something, oh, that was a joke, he wasn't serious. And I think as a president, like we shouldn't be confused about what is real. And in this particular case, it would never be appropriate to joke about something like that. So we definitely cannot take that as something that we can't dismiss it that way. And so I think that, um, again, these are alleged comments, but they are in line with comments that he has said in the past. And journalists have verified the comments. Uh, some of the outlets uh, have independently verified the comments. And the truth of the matter is that even Fox News has yes. verified the comments. He tried to have the reporter fired who had verified the comments, but even Fox News has verified the comments. Uh, I don't even really like to say Fox News because I don't, I have a belief in what journalism should be, um, but I'll say Fox 
verified the comments. Did you find it? Yes. So the group, um, it's, the, it's actually the independent daily newspaper of the U.S. military, and they are called Stars and Stripes. So they are the journalists and reporters who actually broke the story. And then it went to the Atlantic that yes. broke it in terms of general market newspaper and then the Washington, I mean, news, general market reporting as a magazine and then the Washington Post and the other outlets picked it up. Correct. So if Stars and Stripes broke it, I, I am doubly inclined to believe it. And unfortunately, Stars and Stripes is now under attack for of course. sharing the information. And I just, I feel like Stars news and Stripes is, so is being repressed is what Correct. they're being. They're being silenced and repressed with Trump saying, I had this government and the military is part of my government and how dare they say anything against me. So Stars and Stripes reporters and some, I don't know how low this country has to go, really, before we stop this madness. It has nothing to do with Republican or Democrat. It's how low are we going to go on this? Um, so here you have, if Stars and Stripes reports it, this is a, 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 a news outlet that has been part of the military, been in the trenches with the military, even if it has journalists who are and are not part of the military, that's the outlet that has the back of the military and has for years. So I, I can't be dismissive of Stars and Stripes. Right. And I, I just, you know, that was one thing in the news this uh, past weekend. But that's not the only story. <laughs> you know, like just in case we couldn't top that with something else negative, there's another. So I'm just, I think so many of us are facing just fatigue emotionally listening to these stories because I think they're so depraved. And I just want to introduce the next story. The next story is that. Trump bans diversity training, claiming it's divisive, anti-American propaganda. And that headline was in Forbes yesterday, September 5th, 2020. And when I read it, it was like, I want to be shocked, but this is in line with... <laughs> but when you scroll down in that article, it talks about how he is annoyed that what has angered him is that these training courses, which means also the training of the police and those agencies that, you know, come on, folks. Um, this is the Justice Department. If, if it's federal, it's the Justice Department. It's the trainers of those who train the police and fan out to the states and local governments. It's every part of the U.S. government that is going, it's supposed to go into denial now. Right, about all federal agencies. All federal agencies, which means that the federal agencies that supply also the funds for training in state and local can't do it anymore. This is the ultimate repression, but when you go down that article, you'll see that one of the things that he is calling out as un-American is being divisive in talking about white privilege and how they have to stop white privilege. Well, for heaven's sakes, it is the ultimate of white privilege that he, as a white man, uses his privilege to sign some kind of a directive or, or direct some kind of a directive that someone else is signing to say that there is no white privilege. Even as we have every single week another Black person being murdered or maimed by the police, 
even as we have white people in the streets saying, not in our name, don't do this any longer, now that we really understand what's, being, what's going on, and they are using their white privilege to say, you didn't listen to all the black folks who were saying that this is what was going on. Listen, we are out here too. Um, they are activating their white privilege in a different way, in a more positive way. And he is telling people that if you even acknowledge white privilege, that you're going to be defunded. You know, this is, and then William Barr, his consigliere at government expense is saying there's no such thing as systemic racism. Even as, you know, it, it's back to the old thing. Are you going to see what I told you or are you going to see what you see with your lying eyes? And so, at every turn, they are telling us, see what I tell you. Don't see what you see with your lying eyes. You know, the, the article is just, you know, I, I felt like I just couldn't be surprised anymore. And so I wanted to share just a little segment about what it, what it says. And it says that Trump is now prohibiting federal agencies from conducting cultural sensitivity trainings because according to the report, they are divisive, divisive anti-American propaganda. Diversity trainings that focus on educating participants about white privilege critical race theory and racist origins of the United States apparently create division and resentment among federal employees. So that is a direct quote from the article. And I, I just, you know, we're living in a time where it's even more apparent that systemic racism exists. It always has, and I think in the Black community, we always recognized it, but we felt like progress was still being made. And so in recent years, it doesn't feel like progress, it feels like we are stagnant. And I think that, yes, it's an uncomfortable conversation. Yes, people are offended when you talk about race in America, but that doesn't mean that we can't have uncomfortable conversations. It doesn't mean that we cannot try to progress still. And so I think that to have the person at the top level of our country saying, oh, this is divisive, let's not discuss it, let's end these trainings, I think it's a, a step in the wrong direction and it's a move backwards, especially at a time that is so critical for us to provide unity and for us to make sense of the divided America. It has been divided for many years. This isn't new. And so we should be having these conversations. We should be talking about them. That is why you and I have these conversations and we don't shy away from them because it is important for us to face and address these things head on. Because if we don't, we will be doomed to repeat them. In one of our conversations that we had in the past, we talked about how history wasn't being taught factually in our schools. And look at us now. We are literally repeating history because if we don't talk about it, we are doomed to repeat it. Well, some of us want to repeat it. That is part of the problem. And I think one of the things that we have to start talking about when we talk about Trump is that those people who support him and then make excuses for him and all of that, I've been thinking about that a lot and saying, well, what is it? Uh, one of the things that's happening on the more progressive side is that they're saying, well, it, it's just not true, and we have more facts, and the facts are wrong. And of course, 
they're not paying any attention to facts. Of course they don't want to hear the truth. It, because it's not about that anymore for them. And so I keep wondering, well, what is it? And I think what it's about is identity for people who are supporting Trump. Many of these people, not all, but many, too many, are people who they're needy in some way in themselves. And racism and sexism have given them something to feel better about themselves with. And you can't tell me that that wasn't a key need because he comes down the escalator answering that need. It's the first thing out of his mouth as a candidate. He's not stupid. He comes down the escalator addressing, he's a marketer. And the first thing he does as a marketer, which any marketer does, is to study the needs of your market. And the first thing he gives his market is racism and a good dose of sexism. So when you went for him that first time, Frankly, the minute I heard that, I knew to stay away from him because racism and sexism isn't something that I have tolerance for. But for some people, it is. It is a way of getting where they feel they want to go. You know, when, when at the height of segregation, uh, when people were first doing you know, or coming out of segregation in, in the practical sense because it was anti-busing or anti-housing discrimination. So it was how to enact the practical realities of housing and education. The clips of people at that time, they were saying they're taking everything away from us. And if these Blacks come into our area, what do we have? They relied on segregation to feel that they had something for themselves. That's why I'm saying I'm beginning to understand that our way to counteract this toxin that Trump pours in to the national stream every single day, twice a day, or 80 times a day in one day when he was tweeting all day long, um, is addressing this issue of identity, what those people feel they need, and what he feels that he has to offer that can get him what he needs. It's, it's an on, and one more point on the issue of this training or lack of training, this concept began actually in New, New Mexico and Arizona um, within the last 10 years. They passed laws that sound okay on the surface. The surface was that the curriculum cannot have material in it that will encourage any group to hate another group. That was the cover that they used for it. But what it, so people bought into it. No, people shouldn't hate each other, fine. But what they used it for was to, especially in Arizona and New Mexico, with the high numbers of- Indigenous people. Indigenous people and Chicano people was to completely cut out ethnic studies programs saying that those programs in telling the truth about what had happened to those people in the United States. Those programs were therefore encouraging hatred of white people. That is the practical reality of what we're doing here. And anybody who says, well, that's just the federal and local, no, 
the Department of Education funnels money to all state education departments. And the Department of Education is under that directive. Okay. Right. And I just want to bring out one small point before we end the conversation about this. And that is diversity and inclusion is not just about race relations. It's also about people who are disabled. Yes. And I think it's so important for us to understand that the disabled community are under attack every day. And we, we have to be very careful when we see mandates that don't um, encourage companies and agencies to make provisions for that community. And so we have, to, we have to look at these laws and we have to really educate ourselves. What is the intent and what is going to follow? So as we wrap up that conversation, I just wanna say we have to be cautious. And of course, it's a red flag to us and we see that it's problematic, but we have, to, we have to fight to make a difference and make sure that all of these communities are not attacked and excluded because that's what's happening. And to your point about the disabled, circling back to where we began on that conversation about what Trump did or says he did not say, about the military. Um, part of that was also his remarks about wounded warriors and not wanting wounded veterans to be in, um, in a veterans parade because he said, nobody really wants to see that. You know, it's, that's the level of what we're talking about. So, that's our show for today, but this is our mandate going forward. This is an ultimate human rights issue at every turn. So for today, I'm Janice Adams. And I'm Elle Cole. Thanks for watching. Goodbye now.